I will be right back. I am just grabbing my tea. Box. I've got my teacup. It's not that, that steep. Hope everyone else is having uh, hot beverages tonight. Um, welcome back. Today we are going to be chatting about BP judging. Um, so BP judging is uh, extremely weird. Uh, it's often very difficult. Uh, it's, and we spent the last two sessions figuring out how to get into just what is BP? How does BP work? Um, and that can make it Judging it uh, seems very confronting. It's very difficult to know when to start. It's very difficult to know how to weigh the different teams, especially if you're just figuring out yourself. How does BP uh, fit together? How does it work? Um, so today, what we're going to be doing is just chatting through some of the basics of BP and also some of the common errors that that people make. So hopefully, uh, you can come into this without knowing anything about uh, judging BP. Hopefully, you will have seen the earlier sessions to just introduce you to some of the concepts, uh, like how to do an extension, uh, what should we be looking for. Or in an opening half debate, um, but will also be useful for people who are trying to tune up their BP uh, judging uh, and hopefully going to, to judge some of the minis or going to judge worlds uh, in July. Um, BP judging is also one of the aspects uh, of, of uh, world debating that has an incredible variety within it. So you will often hear people accusing, uh, it's particularly people who come from a different circuit than them of, of judging badly. Um, while there are, of course, people who judge badly in every circuit, um, it, one of the interesting things about BP is it really reflects what, what circuits value, what makes their circuit unique uh, as a debating uh, institution. But of course, we want to try and get uh, as much um, commonality between the ways that we judge so that people know uh, how to win the debates, uh, know what they need to improve on. Uh, and one resource that I'd encourage everyone to look up is the Korea World's uh, team. Uh, one of the friends of the pod, uh, uh, Connor O'Brien, uh, is, is one of the people who's been working on it, have put together uh, a fairly phenomenal judging resource where they have different people given uh, far more in-depth uh, discussions than what we're going to be doing now. Um, and also have some of just the basic rules there. So if you are thinking about a particular issue uh, within within the way that you're judging or how to judge particular things. You can just look it up, uh, figure out um, how to do it, and that's put together by some of the top judges in the world. So if you're at a, a slightly more advanced level uh, and you're looking for very specific advice on how to judge specific things or how to improve your judging in general, go to that. But this will serve, I think, as a very adequate, uh, in fact, an incredibly fun introduction and also an opportunity to have a bit of a discussion about what makes uh, judging BP both wonderful uh, and incredibly weird. So the four things we're going to be talking about today uh, is firstly just the basics. What does it mean to judge BP? What are we looking for when we are ranking the teams? And then how do we present those ideas uh, to the to the uh, to the different teams? Secondly, we're going to go more in depth as to what is meant by a contribution. Because remember, uh, in the earlier episodes, we talked about BP often about being uh, being a flash in the pan, contributing something to debate from your position, uh, and that's what the judges will weigh. And how to a, avoid some of the common mistakes that happen uh, when you are uh, judging, uh, but also how do you um, present them in a way that's systematic uh, to the teams uh, and avoiding some of the things that, 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 that will get you dinged by um, teams. Uh, thirdly, we'll chat about, okay, where do I start when presenting? So we'll go through the, the structure of an oral adjudication, uh, what you should be putting first, what you should be dealing with in your center section, how you should be wrapping up your adjudication, just to make sure that it is tight, BP adjudications famously spiral into 40 minute um, chats from the adjudicator. So, so talking about ways in which you can make sure that it's kept well together uh, and kept efficient. Uh, and then finally, we'll be talking about the competitive aspect of judging. Because I think BP uh, 
VP judging is, is quite weird. It's a little bit different to Austral's in that what you're doing is consensus judging. So talking about what you do when you are um, a panel, what you should be doing as a chair, uh, how you should be contributing to making sure that you as a collective panel come to the right decision uh, and how to avoid the common mistakes that in the discussion room often mean that other judges don't listen to you or aren't able to follow uh, what you're saying appropriately. Um, remember, as always, we have club night after this. So make sure that you come along, write in the comments. Uh, if you're, well, there, there'll hopefully be a link in the comments about um, about uh, coming to speak at our clubs nights will be held online uh, as, as unfortunately as usual now. Um, uh, and until the end of lockdown, uh, which hopefully will be relatively soon. Uh, and if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments uh, and we'll be able to get to them uh, as is useful. Okay, neat. I think we can move on then uh, to discussing the first bit of judging uh, theory that we're going to be doing. And that is essentially, what is the foundation of judging uh, BP debating? And if I were to isolate one thing that people need to have in their minds when they're starting to approach it, uh, is BP judging is not about just abstractly coming to an order of teams one to four. It is about specifically comparing teams and why one team comes over uh, another. And this is a big jump you will make in your debating uh, and in your adjudicating when you start thinking about PP, not how do I win this debate or how do I avoid losing this debate, but how do I move myself relative to the other teams within the debate, which will hopefully be reflected in the adjudication. And I think that's good feedback, both for your debating uh, and your adjudicating skills. Uh, as an adjudicator, it allows you to present things in a way that are quite clear for the teams. Uh, and as a speaker, it means that you can start identifying the things that you need to do, not to move you from a fourth to a first, uh, but move you to second to third or from se second uh, to first. The, the, the things you need, the, the steps within debating that can help improve your overall results, even if you're not trying to absolutely uh, smash the debate, win the debate, because uh, that is likely to blow up in your face uh, and lead to uh, a fourth. So when people are delivering their adjudications, you need to be thinking about not just what is the contribution um, of a particular team to the debate as a whole, but how should you weigh the contributions of, uh, for example, closing opposition against the contributions of opening government? And it can be quite difficult to do that. It can often be seen like oh, there's no real way to compare these two different teams. Uh, but when you're going to place one over the other, you need an answer as to why um, what, why you are able to do it. Though, of course, uh, it is it is vital to keep the team by team structure in your mind. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, for example, if a team has clearly won against every other team and they've done it in an incredibly simple way, you don't need to go, this is how they beat the second place team. This is how they beat the third place team. This is how they beat the fourth place team. You can say they beat all of the teams by contributing this. Um, and as I'll explain the rest of my adjudication, I think this contribution uh, is more meaningful than anything else uh, that follows. So sometimes contributions aren't only useful against uh, the team that is above and below, but can help you situate them uh, as a whole within the debate. Uh, so don't be afraid of using that efficiency gain that you can get for, from uh, explaining why one team takes it over all the other teams, but make sure you explain why each team takes it over the next team. Because second is always going to be thinking, oh, why didn't I get first in this debate? Third will always be thinking, I thought I was in the top off. Uh, and fourth will be saying, there's no way I got the donut. Surely I beat this one team. Uh, so that is the, the primary importance that you need to explain to the different teams. Um, so that I think sets up the, the crucible of the debate. When you are going through your rankings, you are doing it in a team by team manner. You're comparing one team against another team uh, to come to a decision. Uh, and what we are essentially looking for there, and this comes to the second part uh, of our discussion today, is we're looking for the contribution of the team. Uh, and in all of the earlier episodes that we've done specifically on BP, we've talked about what it means to have a contribution. How should you set up an extension? What are the strategies you can do at opening uh, to maximize the contribution uh, that you are adding? Uh, and so what you do as an adjudicator is essentially put that theory that we've been learning for speakers to do into practice when you're adjudicating and assessing how well the different teams um, do it. What I would note that is potentially one of the most, um, one, of, one of the more annoying things about the way that BP is judged is sometimes uh, the, the, there used to be a very strong focus on, on the role of particular teams. How well have they fulfilled their role? Uh, and we've moved quite far away from that uh, quite rightly as a judging community uh, towards just weighing a argument. Um, and what you need to be doing is not just uh, figuring out 
did this person sound like a good opening government? But you need to be comparing their arguments that they bring against the other arguments that are brought within the debate. It is not different to other types of debating. It is all still just about is one argument better than another argument? Have they been able to prove the things that they want to prove? Uh, has the burden that they have been adopted been, been uh, met by the, by, by the arguments that they're able to bring? So in many ways, you shouldn't throw away all of your 3v3 judging uh, knowledge. You just need to do it uh, in a more 3D chess kind of way, in a more three-dimensional way, uh, comparing arguments across the board. What is also important uh, is that when we are weighing uh, arguments, sometimes teams will be arguing for the same thing. So you'll think of the same argument, like how do we achieve X? Uh, so what is important when you're assessing down the bench comparisons is weighing the contribution to an argument. How important were they to proving this particular thing that is able to get them across the line? I think there's potentially a, a too strong bias towards crediting the team that finishes the argument, uh, that, just, that just rounds it off and explains where they get slightly more and then crediting them with all that material. You need to make sure that you're only crediting them, not with the impact that comes out of something, but with their degree of contribution to that overall impact. Uh, and often when people think of finishing arguments, if a link is truly crucial to proving any impact occurs, then yes, they have contributed a lot to that argument and they should be credited a lot for it. But often when people are finishing arguments, realistically what they're doing is just proving why it's more intense than what was able to be proved at the opening team. So you don't credit them for that whole argument, uh, you credit them for the amount to, of contribution they have to that argument, how much additional are they able to prove, uh, and make sure you are crediting that. Um, so making sure you are uh, crediting contributions to an argument that's already within the debate, but not over crediting it, making sure that you keep in mind, okay, this is an argument that was already in the debate, how much extra was able to be proved by this team that has come afterwards uh, or closing. Something that I think uh, is, is then also quite important when you're keeping this, this is just about weighing arguments, making sure that we've got uh, what we're adding something to the debate that helps you convince yes or no as to the particular motion that is being discussed is that when you're adjudicating, avoid value statements. It is so easy in BP particularly to allow yourself to be dominated by statements where I found this argument really interesting. This argument fitted in with what I thought was the best direction for this debate to go in. Um, uh, I, I think that this argument uh, was a really novel, cool extension, or I think it, it set a really good foundation uh, for the debate. Um, make sure that what you're actually doing is always weighing the arguments as opposed to trying to shoe in, um, shoehorn in other parameters into the debate that aren't particularly necessary to judging the debate. And often you'll hear t uh, like adjudicators be say, what I really liked is they added um, a really clean characterization uh, and then just leave it at that when realistically what they need to be doing is explaining how it fits into the argumentation of the debate uh, and is able to be carried forward. So really make sure you're not being shallow. Make sure you are still bringing in the same rigor that you do with 3v3 debating to compare whether different arguments are proved, to compare how much impacts come out of it, and to ca compare uh, how much we care about that, what is the relevance that it has uh, to the debate overall. Make sure you're not just using shallow statements about they fulfilled their role or they've done this or they've done this. It's always about the arguments. Make sure you hold that particularly clear. So what we're going to do next is chat about um, some of the basic mistakes that people make in thinking about contributions, uh, in particular around extensions uh, and opening and the way in which often circuits assess these uh, teams by different metrics when they shouldn't be doing that. They're still just assessing the same basic thing in debating. Have they brought an argument that helps me convince me uh, of the motion? Yes or no? Um, and, and go through some of the ways in which uh, they are treated differently and potentially shouldn't be. So often what will happen, and I think this happens particularly in the New Zealand circuit, is that we over credit extensions. We make it too easy for extension teams uh, to win a debate because essentially we set the bar too low for them. We ask, is this contribution novel? Is this contribution interesting? Is this a extension a contribution to the debate? Um, and then give it way too much credit within the debate because they've been able to find something that, that is as important as what has been brought by the opening team. This is unfortunately not how you should be um, judging debates. You should be judging whether the extension, if you had heard that at opening, if it was a good argument coming from open and if it was proved, is that something that could still win them the debate? If you're assessing uh, extensions by a metric that is far lower than what you are asking for your opening teams, you are doing the wrong thing and you are under crediting uh, your opening teams uh, and over crediting the teams uh, that are at extension. Because remember, there are benefits to being at an opening because obviously you get to take the, the strongest material, but there are also benefits in closing that you get to think through things better, you get to be creative. Uh, and, and so you have to hold your closing teams to a high standard. Uh, and in fact, the same standard that you hold your opening teams to is this argument good? 
Does it convince me of things that are relevant to the debate? How much of a contribution is it? In other circuits, I think the flip side is applied um, in that often what is required of the opening teams will be slightly less than what is required of the closing teams because they think, oh, the closing teams have lots of time to prepare, lots of time to make sure that they, they make arguments in really clear, clever ways uh, and, and make a higher mechanistic burden on the closing teams uh, than an opening teams. Opening teams require mechanisms just as much as extension teams, because why? That is essential to an argument that can convince you of one thing uh, or another uh, within the debate. And just because they have a short prep time doesn't mean that that's an excuse to not have uh, clearly well walked through mechanisms. Of course, it can be a little bit like sloppy or can be not as clean or nice, but the, 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 the arguments need to be there uh, and they need to be solid. So essentially what I want to convince you of here is that you should be assessing your opening teams and your closing teams in many ways by the same metric. Has the new stuff that they have brought to the debate convinced me more than the stuff that has come before uh, or after and relative to the other teams? Make sure you are asking the same questions you would ask in 3v3. Has this argument been proved? Are there impacts that flow from it? Uh, that, that are how, how big are the impacts that flow from it? And then finally, how important are those impacts? How much should I care about that? Have the teams weighed appropriate from, uh, appropriately for me uh, how much this should matter uh, within the debate? And if you aren't doing that, if you're resting on um, cliches about what extensions uh, should be or cliches about what an opening team needs to do, uh, you are being slightly left behind by, by the trajectory of debating. So make sure you are avoiding that. An additional thing that is often uh, missed when you are um, assessing your, your uh, closing teams is often you aren't assessing their rebuttal contribution uh, in a way that is, is meaningful. Uh, and what I would ask you to do here is that sometimes, uh, well, firstly, make sure you're paying a lot of attention to rebuttal. Rebuttal is, in fact, just as important a contribution uh, as a substantive point to the degree that it is able to convince you um, not to follow along with the motion. But you actually just need to treat it almost exactly the same way. Where the ideas of rebuttal have come out uh, at an opening team, you need to ask yourself, just as if it was a substantive point, how much extra is able to be proved by the closing team such so that it should credit their, their, their contribution as something uh, that is meaningful within the debate. And rebuttal extensions are valid. You can win a debate with a rebuttal extension. Um, I mean, it would have to be truly magnificent. It would have to like obliterate the next best team, probably on the, on the diagonal or, or the across, um, and in fact, turn their positives into a, into a harm against them um, in the way that it is almost like a substantive point. Um, but, but rebuttal is something that is really a meaningful contribution to the debate. Treat it the same way as you treat a substantive point. I have said many times, in the, in the non-VP version of these live streams uh, that, in fact, substantive rebuttal aren't actually different things. They're still just arguments that help convince you one way or the other in a debate. And if you decrease the amount of persuasiveness that another team is doing, that is the same as adding more arguments on your side of the house um, that, that, that increase the impetus uh, to do something. Uh, so make sure that as an adjudicator, you are appropriately crediting uh, a, a rebuttal as something that can convince you of something within a debate. Uh, and then secondly, how much new rebuttal has been brought? What is the addition from the closing team um, in terms of the rebuttal that is brought before? And often, and this is one of the harder things to track within the debate, you'll have, say, for example, an opening opposition that, that brings a, a premise. They want to prove that premise. And if they prove that premise, they've, they've probably won the debate. You'll have three responses from a, an, an opening team. You'll have four responses from a closing team, two of which will be quite derivative of what the opening has said. And so there's a difficulty there in assessing um, whether one team, or like, like how strong one team or the other. So you just have to actually like ask yourself, just as you would for the substantive points, has this argument, has this response been proven? Has it been made well? Has it convinced me of something? How much should I credit it? Um, the last thing to talk about is stuff that falls out of the debate, uh, or more generally, how do you weigh contributions that don't engage with each other? Um, so there are two things, uh, two things that, that I do, and I think many judges do, when they assess uh, material that hasn't um, been engaged with each other. And, and often this will happen when you have like an opening government argument uh, and then the debate moves far away from them and then the closing opposition has also brought a good contribution and you're trying to weigh which of these is better and neither of them have really talked about each other, they're not inconsistent, they're different aspects of the debate um, and you're kind of left at a loss there. Uh, so if it is true that there has truly been no engagement and these, these ideas can just exist in a world entirely parallel to each other um, 
then what you do is you just ask yourself, uh, you do the robustness test. You'd be like, what is valued by the average reasonable voter? Um, and then you decide which of the arguments you think was, made, was, was able to prove something that was of more relevance within the debate, which will obviously be a combination of how ambitious the point was, how much does it claim to be able to prove, and then how much it was able to be proved within the speeches. So at some point, you just have to say, which of the points is better? I'm going to try as much as I can to to adopt a standard objective perspective. What does the average reasonable voter care about? Which of these two arguments would they find more persuasive? But that is a last step within debating. And there's actually quite a few things that, that come before that. Um, and it is not just, for example, to say, um, yeah, it is not enough to just say, oh, these arguments uh, haven't had direct comparison, therefore they can't be compared, therefore I have to delegate uh, to my intuitive sense of what is right uh, and what is wrong. Uh, the first is that teams need to do weighing. Um, and so if it's not just do, does one team find that, well, does the reasonable voter find one thing more persuasive than another thing? The teams will try and tell you how persuasive an argument is. They'll say it'll affect these this many people. Um, we should care about this a lot because we have a duty to those people. They'll, they'll bring arguments that are designed to increase the robustness of their argument. So make sure you're not just taking the headline of the point. You actually look at the way that the teams are weigh that material. And often this is something that befalls opening teams. Opening teams will forget to weigh their arguments. They'll think they've brought the most compelling uh, case but then there's no comparative analysis done as to why this is something that should particularly be done, uh, should, should particularly be cared about, um, and, and they'll be over-credited for those arguments. Uh, because remember, you should, should not insert yourself unless you have to, um, to resolve a particular clash. Uh, but of course, there's also a temptation to overcredit a response from, from a closing to an opposition team. Make sure you are assessing, well, make sure you have in the back of your mind that opening teams cannot respond to every crazy argument that comes out of their opening teams. They could tell you that, ah, oh, the, the opening's claim is, is not true because um, cats went extinct last year. So like, like you could make, obviously, claims that won't be responded to. That doesn't mean you have to accept a claim. You have to ask yourself how robust those claims are. You have to ask yourself, was the opening material set up in a way that is resistant to the claims uh, that later fall out. Uh, and often opening teams will have that in mind. They'll build in preemptive material that, that forestall the strongest attacks that could be brought um, against it. They'll make sure to weigh it in a way that is particularly clear. Uh, so don't over credit responses just because it was a response. I think this happens a lot in 3v3. They'll be like the last response wins rather than what is the best response? What is, what is, was the, the point strong enough to withstand that attack uh, intuitively? Um, and so there's, there'll be an over-crediting of those responses. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, the last thing to say is that other teams not responding to you is not a reason to lose debate. So if you are an opening team uh, and you bring a good argument and then every team chooses to ignore you, they don't automatically get the win but they don't automatically get the loss. You ask yourself, what have they been able to prove? How strong is their argument? Uh, is it something that is of value within the debate? Uh, and therefore, are they able to win the debate? Um, so so that, that you, you can't punish a team just because a team hasn't been responded to. You just do the same thing you would do as if they'd been responded to, but the responses uh, simply uh, weren't particularly strong. Uh, and you ask yourself whether or not they've been able to prove the meaning they claim. And it's very useful if opposition doesn't respond to you realistically for your re rankings relative to everyone else. Obviously, Obviously, it doesn't make your argument stronger, uh, but it means that your argument isn't weakened by the responses that came out uh, of your opposition teams. They've missed an opportunity uh, to try and decrease the amount of what you've proven. And so obviously, that's actually something that is quite useful to you. So definitely don't punish teams that are doing it. Um, if you don't engage with an argument from an opposition, once again, that is not a reason to automatically lose, and that is not a reason to automatically win. It just means that you've been you've allowed the best version of their argument to continue uh, to exist, and that is something that is harmful to you um, because it allows them to have a contribution that is more meaningful than your contribution, and also is a missed opportunity for you to be able to boost your contribution to the debate by responding to the opposition's points. Uh, so the thing to take out of that is make sure you are responding. Other teams will benefit if you don't respond, and you miss out on an opportunity uh, to build your contribution uh, within the debate. Of course, there is a discussion, uh, a, a discussion of uh, judicial philosophy about when teams are basically tied. So they brought arguments that are equivalently good to each other. Some judges will put a strong uh, burden on the closing team to engage because obviously they're the only ones with the opportunity to do. Uh, there will be some people who do this at a very, very high level. So what I would encourage you to do is if you're ever in that situation, you get out your little judging manual, your career uh, world's judging manual, uh, you look it up because I'm not entirely sure the answer to that. 
Uh, I think it's very, very rare. You actually truly have teams that are absolutely tied. So I think it is a little bit lazy to rest on, on that as a justification for why one team is able to lose or another team uh, is able to win. Make sure that you are just doing judging as you ordinarily would. And remember, you would never at the end of an unclashing uh, 3v3 debate say, oh, this is basically a tie. I need to defer to, to, a, to a weird uh, conception of, how, of, of how, how the rules of BP works in order to decide which teams, uh, which teams win. Um, and if you're a judge that does that, I didn't mean to be subtweeting you, um, but you know, improve as judges. Last two things to talk about with contributions. Uh, and this is something that will deeply, deeply frustrate teams. Um, so one of the, one of the things is um, uh, how do we credit a uh, deputy leader of the opposition? Because obviously you've got your opening team, they present their arguments, uh, and then deputy leader of the opposition stands up and says, I have two pieces of extension, uh, and then bring entirely new arguments. How do you credit in that clash, those new arguments that come over it? The trend has been to over credit those arguments, um, to say that just to take them at their best and be like, well, at the end of this, those arguments stood, I had had no response to them, therefore they're able to win. You need to be cognizant of the fact there is literally no way that the opening government team can respond to the argument that is brought out at DLO, uh, because it is something that just exists within the debate. Um, after they have spoken, just like they would with the closing stuff. So you have to do an assessment of which argument uh, is more robust as if it was something that was not uh, engaged with. But that is not to say that DLO speech does not matter uh, or the extension material that they bring does not matter uh, in assessing it with the opening government. Because if you are a DLO speaker who brings phenomenal, awesome arguments at, uh, at DLO, obviously your opening team can't respond to them, but they can still be very good arguments that should be credited and they have two speeches. So you should also have the opportunity uh, to have two speeches. You just need to make sure that you're not crediting them by virtue of them not having been responded to in the opening half of the debate. Uh, and it assess it much in the same way that you'd assess the comparison between an argument brought at closing and an argument that has been brought uh, at opening. It can still win the debate. Closing teams can beat their opening teams, even though opening teams don't have explicit reason uh, to counter them, but you, you shouldn't, shouldn't just draw a line through the opening half and say, well, everything that's been unresponded to now um, favors the team that, that was the last to speak, because that naturally will just become a bias in your adjudicating towards opening oppositions, winning the opening clash, just by virtue of being able to speak last, so be cognizant of that. The second important area uh, that is very, very similar is how do you credit new material at Upwhip? Very simply, if the uh, Upwhip is bringing new substantive material, uh, none of that can be credited, so don't credit it against any within the debate. They are not a substantive speaker. They're not allowed to bring any new substantive arguments. Uh, they are allowed to bring some new responsive material, especially to new stuff that has come out uh, at, at GovWhip or, or new responses that have come out at GovWhip. So, so remember, if we're going down the chains, but they're not allowed to broaden the debate into anything that is pre-existing. I think sometimes people take this too far uh, and say that any contribution that comes out at, at, at up whip by virtue of not being able to be responded to shouldn't matter within the debate. But then why do we have an up whip uh, at all? Obviously up whips uh, do more than just reshuffling material. They, they do add uh, framings to the debate. They do make sure uh, that they that they complete lines of argumentation uh, to the degree that they, that they can be completed, but anything substantive can't be credited within the debate. Uh, so be, be careful at, if you are an off-whip speaker of not bringing in uh, new substantive uh, into the debate but, or, or new responses that are far beyond the pale of what has been discussed within the debate, but you still definitely have a role and make sure you aren't under crediting uh, their material either. Okay, so now we are getting, uh, we've, we've finished much of the theoretical aspect uh, of, of how to judge BP debating. Uh, and what we can chat about now is what exactly are we looking for when we set up an adjudication? How should you be going through your adjudication? Where do I start? Um, so in 3v3, you'll remember that the structure that was uh, generally encouraged the structure of clashes. So sometimes you'll give a little bit of general feedback, you'll announce the verdict, make sure you announce the verdict. It is really, really awful for teams to try and figure out whether they've won or lost um, while, while you're chatting away about your various reckons about the debate. Um, so where you, and, and so yeah, make sure you announce it and then you'll, you'll get to your particular clashes. Unless you want to give an adjudication that is three times the length of a, um, of a, of a 3v3 adjudication, you need to be a little bit more efficient in how you uh, set up your adjudication. Uh, and some people have a very strict way of doing it. Uh, they'll say, okay, what I do is I assess the opening half uh, first, and then I assess the closing half and which one won out of that. Uh, and then I 
assess any of the diagram clashes. Uh, and some people say, well, I'll start with whoever wins the debate. I'll explain why they win the debate, and then I'll explain why the second person won the debate, and then the third person, and then the fourth team. And some will do the opposite, and I'll start at fourth and go up to first. What I would encourage you to do is try and figure out which bits of the debate uh, are important to know in assessing lots of the clashes, and then put that material first. And that will often, I find, be the opening clash, because understanding what the opening teams have brought to the debate uh, is important to uh, weigh the extensions that have come out uh, from the closing team. So I, I tend to find that quite a natural way to do that. But of course, if you have a uh, closing team that is either clearly won or clearly lost um, by virtue of either not having an extension or having an extension that just smashes the rest of the debate out of the park, it could be very natural to say, um, what I'm going to do first is explain why closing opposition wins this debate. Um, I think they win this debate because they bring this extension. It was proved it is superior to the rest of the debate that was locked in this particular argument uh, because the impact was much larger, because they're able to prove X, Y, and Z, the same, the same way you'd ordinarily judge the debate. Uh, and then in particular, why I think they beat the team that is closest to them. Uh, the closing is because of, I don't know, the quality of the responses that they brought and the substantive when compared against the substantive of that other team, which was X, Y, and Z, uh, we should consider it as more as more persuasive uh, for all of these reasons. Uh, and then you just go down the chain like that into, into discussing um, the different teams. Uh, but often it's useful to, to start at opening because you're doing things like assessing derivativeness uh, and assessing whether or not um, there's been knifing or inconsistency often uh, with, with, with relation to your opening teams. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's often good to start with, with one of those opening teams and explain why the debate has been set up. I would avoid going in a strictly chronological fashion because that lends itself to just being too descriptive. Remember, your job, especially in a BP debate, is not to describe what has happened. It's to explain why one team has been more persuasive than the other. Uh, and so often you'll be very quick and when you're describing things, you'll be like, this was the point that was argued, uh, I think it was well made because they were able with these specific links uh, to, to take the point home. I don't think there were uh, adequate responses or any response for opposition uh, or there were two responses from the opposition, but these failed for this reason and this reason. This is the most important thing within the debate, uh, because X, Y, and Z, um, and therefore the panel was comfortable giving them the first of all teams within this debate. Um, now to describe why, in particular, they meet the team that is closest to them. Uh, and remember, you need to be doing it in steps. You need to explain why one team is beating another team. It's always comparative. Um, and so to stand up and say, uh, now to assess the clash, uh, the, the, the yeah, clash between opening government and closing opposition. Why do we think that opening government was sufficient uh, to take it over the closing opposition? And then you'll say, these were the two contributions of both teams. Here's how they engaged with each other. Here's how they didn't engage with each other. Here's the argument that we thought was more persuasive. Um, or uh, for example, if it's a closing opposition team, uh, this is just an example. So say your closing opposition has beaten uh, opening government. Uh, you'll say, this was the contribution from opening government. It was a good contribution. Uh, it was proven within the debate. Uh, and we, we thought that these impacts flew off them. Uh, and these impacts were, were this amount uh, of important. The reason why we think the closing opposition team wins uh, still beats them is twofold. Firstly, they had a good substantive contribution. Uh, it is not as meaningful or as strong as the substantive contribution uh, that has been brought by the opening team. Uh, but we think puts them over the line is very strong responsive material. They're able to mitigate a lot of the benefits from opening that their opening team had a managed to do, and they managed to blow the, uh, destroy the extension, that, a strong extension that came out um, of, the, of the closing opposition. Because remember, if you are responding to something that is strong within the debate, that seems well proven, that seems quite robust, and you're still able to beat it, that is a good contribution to the debate uh, and can be credited uh, strongly. So what, what you'll see there is that it's not just the responsiveness between the teams that is necessary to explain why one comes over the other. Sometimes it can be, do, it, it can be what they do to other teams, how well well, they contribute to the overall debate uh, that is meaningful to whether they win or lose. And sometimes in a very close comparison to so say, you think that the two opening teams have fought themselves to a standstill. Um, sometimes it can even be a POI that gets it over. So with the way in which we were able to break this is we thought there was a very good POI that came from the opening team that we think pinned back a lot of the benefits that the closing uh, opposition wanted to claim. Uh, and we thought that was a sufficient contribution to the debate to tilt it over to them in that opening clash. Uh, now to the third and fourth clash, why do we think that one team came the other. So as you can see, it's always about those steps and it's always about figuring out what the team's contribution was, uh, whether it was framing, whether it was substantive, uh, or whether it was rebuttal. 
Um, in terms of general feedback that, that you give to the teams, uh, I would avoid giving overly long general feedback, mainly because these debates are incredibly diverse. Lots of things are happening uh, within them at, at different stages. Uh, and so general feedback will be quite applicable to one team, but will just be vastly unapplicable to the other teams within the debate. So making sure you're clearly walking through what specifically uh, each team is, is able to prove um, and then you can give the feedback to them when you're going through the clashes. A way in which I think you could have come above uh, the team that came above you uh, is if you've been able to respond to this strong material, which at the at the end of the clash with them uh, was, was strong and proven. Um, last thing I'll say, just, just, just to, to tack back a bit that I forgot to say, uh, when you are judging the opening uh, clash, be very careful of crediting responses that come from closing as weakening the arguments that come from opening when you compare them. So say, for example, you have an opening government team uh, that brings a really strong argument uh, and a opening opposition team, which brings a decent argument, but it's clearly less strong than the opening. At the end of that clash, you're convinced that opening government has beaten opening opposition. That is good. Of course, POIs can change that, how they engage backward, but that's the end of their contributions. If a closing team comes through and demolishes the stronger team, like just rebuts them to pieces, it exposes all of these weaknesses and just ruthlessly uh, destroys it, that cannot help their opening team. So you don't just want to assess at the end of the debate what is left within the debate, what has been left. You want to assess the different contributions. And even if a contribution from opening is later rebutted by a stronger closing team, that can still be a meaningful contribution when you're assessing the, the two opening teams. Uh, and, and one of the ways in which you can avoid making sure you don't overly credit stuff that comes uh, uh, later within the debate is just decide at the end of the, the DLO speaker, uh, with the robustness of the arguments that have been brought, uh, which of the team uh, that then wins uh, over the other team. Of course, responses from the uh, from closing teams can change the way you feel about those opening uh, arguments, but 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 remember that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily bring down the robustness. So say you were just judging badly in the opening half and you, you got totally hoodwinked by this point that on reflection was actually not a very robust point at all. You could potentially change your rankings, but avoid uh, overly using the, the, the closing responses as, as assessing the robustness of that opening clash because um, otherwise that would just give a, a big advantage to the team that has the stronger team on their bench um, which isn't something we want to do within debate because it's about assessing your individual contributions. And if a closing team destroys uh, the other opening team and their opening team hadn't been able to destroy them, uh, this opening team should still take it over the other opening team. And that closing team should take it by a lot because they've been able to uh, bring good material and really beat a strong, well, uh, what was a strong contribution uh, at the time. So let me just have some tea uh, and then we can talk about competitive judging. Uh, and if you have any questions, please flick them into the comments. Uh, and I can answer them now. So if anyone has any questions. Okay, if you're still thinking of questions, just flick them into the comments. Um, but I'll move on to competitive judging uh, and, and the consensus aspect of it. Because uh, often when you are going to these tournaments, you're not just being assessed by uh, the teams. In fact, if you're only if you're the chair in a room, will you be assessed by the teams? Because uh, you'll give the oral adjudication. Unless, of course, you get rolled. So sorry, a better way to phrase that is only the, the judge that ends up giving the oral adjudication uh, is the one that can be assessed by the teams. But you are also being assessed by other people on your panel. So if you're the chair, you're being assessed by the other panel. Uh, and if you are a panelist, you're being assessed uh, by your chair. Uh, some tournaments allow panelist to panelist feedback. That's just determinative uh, of, of the tournament that you are attending. Uh, I really don't like competitive judging. Uh, I do not think uh, that it is an enormously healthy thing. Uh, because could you imagine going to a debating tournament where you had to be assessed by the other teams um, instead of an adjudicator who's objective, who's sitting out? 
and every round was silent. So you had no idea how you were doing. You had no idea um, what to improve. You get no feedback. It is just a cauldron that is very, very poor for your mental health if you uh, allow it to get to yourself uh, too much. Just remember that if you are judging BP, in many ways, this is a service you are doing to the community. Over time, good judges will rise to the top because they often get good feedback. But within a tournament, there's a lot of arbitrariness. You'll just get random feedback because different judges judge different ways. Um, like imagine, like we do so much work trying to make sure that scores are consistent uh, for speakers, and we're still unable to do that poorly. Uh, imagine how bad it is for judges, where judges have no idea really how good another judge is. Different judges judge wildly. The other judge could be like, "Oh, you were fine. I'll give you a five. I think you're just like yeah, you were fine, I'll give you an eight. Uh, or, or another judge will be like, yeah, you were fine, I'll give you a two because I have high standards for judging and you need to be done for it. It's, it's extremely arbitrary, uh, so don't let it get to you too much. So that is my, my caveat about the competitive judging. What you do in BP is called consensus judging. So essentially you get a very short amount of time to think, uh, and then you will tell the, all the other panelists your ranking and then you will discuss those rankings. And sometimes it is very easy because the chair will be like, I went one, two, three, four. And then everyone else will be like, amazing. We all went the same way, everyone agrees. Sometimes no one will agree. You'll have different teams in first and different teams in fourth, it'll be a mess. I had to judge a silent round of worlds and I was chairing. It was a judging, it was a, ju it was a debate about whether or not the United States should pull out of Iraq or something. So like horrifically complicated debate with obviously like very good contributions. It was quite a, like a good mid-room mid debate. So the teams were all onto it. The teams were all bringing responses. They weren't responsive enough to make it clean, but they, they brought good ideas. Uh, and I had five panelists. Uh, and we had to, and everyone had different ideas. We had to find a way to reconcile all of these different ideas into an adjudication that made sense uh, and was clear. And, and what is necessary is if you are a chair, you need to be incredibly efficient. If people are just saying stuff that isn't relevant to coming to your decision, if everyone agrees, unfortunately you need to cut them off and be like a more productive use of our time is discussing this clash, the clash in which people uh, particularly disagree. So you need to have that efficiency within mind. Um, and, then, and then going through those rankings can often be quite, quite a difficult process. What I would say is that you get way less time to think than you do in a 3v3. And this is one of the reasons why I don't really like judging BP. I like having a little bit of time to put my thoughts together. Often when I'm judging in 3v3 on consideration with my notes, I'll change my mind. I'll think, actually, oh, you know, I, I underrated this argument. I think it's enough to swing the debate. And I think that's like a, a valuable process. So what you need to do in BP is your initial ranking don't be too attached to it because often, often it comes as your snapshot of the debate. And as you discuss and you're comparing different ideas and you're saying, I actually thought this contribution was meaningful. You'll be like, yeah, that is a meaningful contribution. That, and, it's, and it's a contribution that you hopefully would have picked up with a little bit more time to think, but those were just your initial vibes. Cause it is about the hive mind, the collective uh, coming to a particular decision rather than about someone producing their own individual decision. Uh, and here's where I'm gonna get a little bit controversial. I think judges uh, overseas, are way too afraid of splitting. Uh, they're like, oh, if a reasonable version is agreed to by the panel, I should just change my vote to agree with it. No, if you are convinced by the other panelists that one team, uh, that you are in fact wrong with your rankings and that one team has taken it over the others, by all means, change your mind. I don't wanna discourage that. That's very useful. And in fact, should reflect the fact that you haven't had as much time to think about it as you would in a 3v3 debate. But there can be two reasonable versions uh, of, of who won a debate. Uh, and I think you should be just as open to splitting as you would in a uh, in a uh, non-consensus uh, style. And so at Worlds, I would often be like, oh, amazing, this has gone so well. I agree with you on this thing, this thing, and this thing. Uh, I still disagree with you about this thing, and so I'm very happy to split. And then judges would be like, what? Why are you splitting? But, but haven't we convinced you? Haven't we been reasonable? I was like, no, I entirely understand why you see the argument like that. Um, I just still think it's incorrect. And, and, and in exactly the same way, I'll often go to um, 3v3 debates uh, and it'll be a 3-2 split decision on the panel and all the panels will be like, yes, that was a good high quality debate. I understand where you are coming from. Uh, so this was how I saw it. This is how I worked through this material. As a norm, don't be afraid of judging. Uh, do, sorry, don't be afraid of splitting. You may be punished for it, I think that is that is one of the sad realities. Some judges will be like, oh, they were obstinate. They, they refused to concede. So make sure you're being incredibly respectful, uh, explaining that you think that their agreement is reasonable. Sometimes they'll think uh, of, of splitting uh, as being a... a... <laughs> yes, I would love some. Thank you. Um, I think of splitting as, that is, is, is being disrespectful to them or, or, the, or the majority um, of the arguments. 
don't buy into that. Just be respectful. Explain why you agree, why you still disagree, why they haven't been able to convince you. And then just let it go. Like, it's okay that they weren't able to convince you. And if someone splits for you, do not punish them unless they're unable to explain why they think their call was reasonable. Um, and don't be like, their call isn't the same as mine, therefore it is unreasonable, because that is not true. That's not true in 3v3 debating. I don't know why it should be uh, in BP debating. Some top tips when you are in the adjudication room. I've already mentioned that chairs, you need to be efficient. You need to drive your team. You need to be like, okay, these are the bits we disagree. Everyone agrees that this team comes first. If we have time at the end, we'll go through why we think that team came first. Uh, but the real disagreement is whether the two middle teams, which of one gets second and which one gets third. Uh, so to start us off, I'd like you to explain why you think that this team came above this team. And if they start waffling about something else, you'll be like, um, sorry, to be specific, I want you to explain your call between this team uh, and this team. And if they're unable to do it, you turn to your other panelists and be like, sorry, uh, this, this, this judge, um, I, I'd like to hear their thoughts as well. So you do it in a quite a diplomatic way, but make sure you don't let people just waffle on about all their thoughts to debate, because you have a very limited amount of time. Teams are waiting, they need the results, so you need to keep things quite uh, efficient in the way that you approach them. Make sure that you give everyone an opportunity to speak on things that are contentious, um, moving downwards into non-contentious stuff. So if you just, if you have three judges uh, that think one clash went one way and one judge that thinks it goes the other way, I would often start with that person. Just be like, explain to us why you think that this one, uh, why, why we should change our minds as to whether or not we, we flip those decisions. So they have a chance to get heard on the contentious issues because uh, realistically people are a lot less miffed about not being able to speak on issues uh, where they agree with everyone. So if everyone agrees with everyone, uh, that's great, leave that to the end, but sometimes you just won't have enough time. And if you're able to iron out those inconsistencies uh, from the actually contentious things, that's the best, uh, that's the best use of your time uh, going through. Make sure you are not being overly dominant, uh, either as a chair or as any panelist. If you are spending the majority of the time speaking, you are doing your job badly. You are there to listen more than you are there to speak. Um, because you want to constantly be assessing your own internal rankings uh, and, and bringing the, the challenges brought by the other uh, adjudicators and seeing whether it changes your mind uh, as to how, how they do that. And when they have convinced you, there's no shame in changing yours. I'll just be like, oh, actually, that's a, that's a very good way of thinking about this. I still think it would be reasonable to call it the other way, but I'm convinced uh, with, with the majority's reasoning uh, on this. Uh, and then the, I think the, the last thing to say is just be hyper respectful. Um, often it can get a little bit like heated in the judging room. You never want to shout at someone. You do have the capacity to change the vote. It's not like uh, in, in New Zealand tournaments, often you'll hear legendary stories of, of judges that have split in different directions, having a 20 minute shouting match about, about who was right. Uh, and, and the minority will be furious that they have, that they've been wrong. But in BP, uh, well, of course you shouldn't bully people in, in 3v3 styles. Um, that, that, that's not what I was implying, but be careful that you don't overly pressure people to change them. You're always, you're not trying to debate yourself. Uh, you were just trying to present why you thought the arguments that were done. And note, if you are such a good debater uh, and such a dominant judge that you are able to easily convince other people of your version, that doesn't make you a good judge. That just makes you good at winning arguments um, in the debating room. And the longer it takes, sorry, in the adjudication room, and the longer the gap between what has happened uh, in your debate and when you come to the decision, the more divorced from reality it becomes. It becomes which of the judges is most able to convince other people rather than which team brought the most arguments. And that's not what you want out uh, within debate. Be hyper respectful, be very humble, especially if you are a good judge, that, that anyone can bring up a new idea that can shift your debate. And I have had phenomenal chair judges um, in the past who've been like, wow, that's a really excellent point, X, Y, Z on my panel. Uh, that changes, uh, I think, my thinking about this uh, thing. I, I think I, I undercredit that, identify what you have done wrong, um, and then driving the, the discussion in a way that, that is appropriate. Okay, so that's my, my bit by bit of, of judging. We might do a future episode where we focus on uh, how to write your notes and how to put things together in a way uh, that makes sense. Uh, but I hope everyone enjoyed this, this introduction to judging. If, if no one has any questions, I'll just write another uh, four or five minutes. Um, if no one has any more questions, uh, we'll sign off there. And I hope you all have a glorious evening. Go have a look at the Korea World's July uh, judging menu. It's very good.
I have to judge the crim moot tonight, uh, as every night this week, but I think I'm going to do it on the balcony. I think the risk of me being rained on is sufficiently low that I might just risk it. Nope, I think that is, that is it for tonight. Um, and if you have any questions just in general, flick me a message, very happy to answer them. <laughs>